Okay. I think we're pretty much ready to start. Y'all set, Thomas? Yes, I'm okay. ready. Well, excellent. Why don't we get going here then? Uh, welcome, everybody. I'd like to thank you for joining us uh, on this webinar. One of the things that the Center for Services Leadership is really blessed with is a very extensive uh, faculty network, and we're very, very proud of the, the people associated with the center. They, they help to just bring such incredible expertise uh, from outside to us and help us to remain uh, a leading center with respect to uh, the provision of understanding how services work and really being on the leading edge of service knowledge. And today we're blessed to have one of our uh, network members, uh, Dr. Thomas Ritter, speak to us, uh, talking about the power of harnessing data for market success. And with that said, I'll turn it over to Thomas. Thanks, Thomas. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, it's, it's very nice to talk about uh, data and digitization and all of that and then being on a webinar. I think that is the, uh, the, the, the new modern way of, uh, of working and, uh, and doing that. So welcome all. And I'm very happy that uh, I get a chance here to share some of the uh, results and some of the ideas we have out of, a, of an industry research project, which, is, uh, which, ha which got the fancy title uh, from big data to big business. Um, and I will explain a little bit of uh, what we have done and, and, and how uh, that, that works. Um, my presentation roughly about uh, half an hour and after that we, we hopefully can discuss and, and share some ideas and also some of your examples and your uh, challenges and, and solutions. Um, if you have questions on the way there should be or we tested it, uh, uh, there is a commentary uh, field so I can see when you type comments in. So then I can maybe already uh, try to answer or comment on these uh, remarks while we go through. Um, our starting point for, for this project it was some four years ago that, um, that there was lots of potential. Everybody uh, was talking about this new wave of data-driven growth and then uh, the amazing amount of money uh, firms were going to make uh, by using data. And the question, the, the, the intro questions I, I have uh, in, in class and in sessions and with companies is, of course, the, have you heard about digitization? And everyone has heard about it. And do you actively work and consider digitization and data for your business? And most of the companies actually do work with data and have over the last couple of years gotten a digitization strategy and, and, and so forth. And then I ask, and how many of you, please raise your hand, do make an awful lot of money by using that data? And this is where normally a few hands come up, but a significantly lower uh, number than on the first two questions. And this is a little bit what, the, what this talk is, is about. I will uh, start out by, by showing how I look at, uh, at business models, and then we put data into the business model so we get some data-driven uh, business development. I'll show you three cases uh, shortly from, from Denmark. I'm sure you haven't heard about the firms or uh, the cases either, so that's a little bit uh, a greeting from Europe. And, uh, and then we will look at the capabilities which are needed, the ingredients uh, for, for success in data-driven growth, and then we will uh, round this off with some lessons learned on the, on the journey. So here we go. Um, if, we, uh, if we look uh, on the uh, on the business model, and I hope you all see my screen, which should be now slide two. And there's a little box in the middle, and it says why. And and for a business model to be developed, it is very important that we know why are we running that business. What is the objective? How much money do we want to earn? Or how many good courses do we want to support? Or whatever the purpose is, we need to know why. Are we doing what we are doing? Because every decision, every strategic decision for the organization will be dependent on why we are doing it. So that's the core of any model. But it is also true for any data-driven project which is around the business model. And I'm typically uh, meeting three kind of different uh, situations. Situation one is that a firm, the members of staff, the leaders, the employees, they have seen a way of using data to 
bring this business to a higher level. They really want to pioneer the industry. They want to they want to compete and win in their markets by coming with a completely new version of their business model using data to optimize and drive growth. That's a good version. Um, type number two, I meet companies which tell me that uh, the reason why they work with data is because all their competitors already have worked with data. So they are falling behind on that agenda. They are, their web interface is not good enough. Their database uh, uh, utilization is not good enough. Their running of the business is not good enough and they need to catch up because otherwise this will be a competitive disadvantage for them to not to do it. Different situation, different decisions, different things to be discussed, but also on the way of digitizing their uh, business model. And the third kind of people are on companies I meet, these are the companies where this, the CEO or somebody leading otherwise in the organization has been to an inspirational tour at Silicon Valley, typically. So, so they come back and they have seen all of that wealth, all of the deals, all of these uh, crazy business models. And now they think they, they need to copy something or they need to have an agenda, but, but that agenda is completely deconnected from the business they actually do. So, so, so then it's, of course, problematic for, for the organization to implement something where there is no real uh, business value uh, as such in, in, in that relation. So, so that is typically what I meet. Uh, the last one is, of course, uh, uh, difficult to handle on a more political, uh, diplomatic uh, scale. The other two are straightforward business. Uh, why are we doing data in, in our business model? If we jump back and then build the business model, uh, the, the next item we need to know is who is the customer? For whom are we here? Um, what kind of segments do we serve? What, uh, what kind of uh, people or organizations should be happily affected by our uh, work with, uh, with, uh, in, in the organization? The second thing we, uh, we need to know is what kind of value proposition do we actually offer to our customers? There's a significant difference between the needs of the customer, which is on the customer side, and the value proposition, i.e. how do we address that need for those customers. And, and, and also on that dimension, uh, we can have lots of strategic discussions in terms of should we include service if we are a product company, should we include products if we are a service company, what kind of data should we include, what kind of offering uh, can we build around uh, data we have in the organization. For me, a very important part is that we are as an organization able to demonstrate the value we aim to uh, propose to our customers. Because no customer will ever buy our value proposition if they're not convinced that this is the right thing. And this is why I have a, a dedicated dimension in my way of drawing business models. And that is how do we demonstrate the value? Is it in meetings, key account management? Is it in advertisement? Is it on the web? Is it brochures? Is this, is this on trade shows and fairs? Uh, how do we convince customers that we have the world's best uh, value proposition for them? And the last element in my business model uh, is uh, capabilities. So what kind or which kind of capabilities do we have in the organization? What is it what we can do what nobody else can do? What is our competitive advantage? What are the resources, the capabilities we are uh, blessed with? And, and if we define and work with these four dimensions, we find out how does the firm earns its profits? What, what is it? And uh, because uh, I'm German and I like squares, I even have extra squares uh, in, in the system. So with these extra corners, uh, we can connect what kind of customers do buy what kind of value proposition. Not all customers should buy everything. We potentially have a differentiated offering and we need to pair up and then we put little crosses or check marks uh, in these uh, matrices. Who buys what? Which customer do we meet in what kind of value demonstration that's nowadays called uh, omni-channel. So we have all the channels uh, below and then we can click in what kind of customers are coming into uh, what kind of channels and how do we deal it. And which capability do we actually apply for the different value proposition 
and for the uh, value demonstrations. So this is this is my little world, uh, uh, how I draw business models, and uh, th this is a fascinating tool, of course, um, which um, which can depict some of the essence of uh, of a business uh, very fast. Now um, this was just for introduction because now we need to put data into this business model. So what happens uh, if, if we put data in? And that looks like this. So one thing which happens is that nowadays organizations feel and see that customers have a need for data. And that need is increasing, again, not for every customer. And this is why we work with a number of organizations to resegment uh, their customers and include a data dimension in the segmentation. But uh, I find it very interesting that nowadays a logistics company which moves uh, boxes, physical stuff, cannot be successful without digitally documenting when they have picked up the package, where it has been, and when they have delivered it. And that data is in, in some of the cases online in real time uh, fueled into the customer's uh, IT system so that they exactly know where their, st where their stuff is. So there is a need out there, and that is new, which firms need to address by their uh, setup on, uh, on data. Another item is, of course, the willingness to share data. That also differentiates customers. We all have pressed, especially on our smartphones, the agree button for data uh, protection law and this, that, and the other. So, so a lot of the data we produce during a day is, is revealed to some of the uh, providers and their apps uh, we use on, on our devices. And, and of course, it is varying. I think we are still in the time where we are all very um, euphoric about uh, the possibilities of, of, of data. But at least in Europe, we have gotten new regulation uh, since May so that if consumers are not willing to share the data, the firms have to make sure that the data is not kept in the organization. So, so there, there will be a new stream, and I think in the future we will see more and more uh, segmentation in terms of willingness to share data, and firms already now need to be aware of that uh, the, the access to data might be limited uh, in, in the future. Um, it, um, it will be stronger and stronger, and some of the scandals we uh, recently uh, witnessed will, will basically, and, enhance and, and speed up uh, that agenda, that there's a new consciousness about uh, willingness to share to share data. So that's what is happening on the customer side and firms need to analyze what, what kind of uh, development are in our markets and, and, and what is the um, customer need and customer willingness we need to address with, with our business model. Uh, on the uh, value proposition, there of course is the opportunity nowadays to have data as a value proposition. Um, banks have for years, if not centuries, had data as a value proposition, for example, um, information about market development, share prices, and, and so forth. So this is not really a new thing. The new thing we see is, is that there are uh, lots of more industries uh, where, where data can be a proposition and you know, pairing up, uh, checking in uh, with the need for data, there is a there is a stronger demand in the market, and so data becomes much more um, a, a value proposition in in itself. Interesting, and for many uh, firms, challenging is the other way around. That value propositions are a data source. So nowadays, uh, with the connected devices, uh, we know um, a lot of the stuff which surrounds us is actually revealing data back into uh, the, the organizations. Uh, that can be everything from your usage of uh, Spotify and Apple Music to some heat pump in your houses to electricity metering and everything else. Nowadays, these uh, units are very, very chatty, meaning that they talk all the time with a central server and reveal some of the uh, information. That is for some of the data-enabled services a necessity, but it has also shown here in Europe uh, with the change in regulation in, in, um, in May that uh, firms got very much aware of that they have devices out there which give them what is person-sensitive data, i.e. you know exactly where the person is, uh, you know maybe their 
diseases. If you're a pharmaceutical company, you know their um, uh, behavioral patterns and so forth. And that has a, a separate protection these days. So there are uh, uh, lots of issues around um, value proposition, either selling data uh, for customers or having devices which automatically return data and that needs to be dealt with uh, in, in the organization correctly. The other item is uh, demonstrations uh, as, as data sources. I think this is, uh, after all, an old known um, example that we all know, uh, click streams on websites. That's exactly what, what this uh, uh, blue arrow indicates, that while customers are in our channels, they leave traces which we digitally can capture and analyze and use in the organization to optimize our sales and marketing uh, functions. So, so, so these demonstrations are also uh, data sources. And... Um, we have heat maps, so we can uh, basically uh, check in shops where are the people most of the time, how long are they in certain places, how can we develop an environment where shopping uh, is optimized in order to drive our business and have growth uh, re related to that. Um, and, and if you uh, want to see a little bit of a feeling what is possible today, then I strongly recommend for all of those who uh, haven't yet been to an Amazon Go shop. I recently visited the one in San Francisco. Um, th this uh, on, on, on one side uh, is fascinating and on another side is, of course, a little bit uh, creepy in a way uh, to, to realize. I mean, in these shops, the sensoric system and so forth is so good that they know what you have taken from the shelf. So there's automatic checkout and there is no registering, no scanning, nothing. Just by pulling it off the shelf in a supermarket, they know exactly what you took uh, and, and have in your bag. Um, so, so we have loads of these uh, possibilities nowadays to, to monitor uh, demonstration and then also actually purchasing. So, so technology has come uh, a long way. The other thing is, of course, uh, the use of data and demonstration. Most of the organizations I work with are increasingly uh, forced to show with data how good their value proposition will be for a customer. So, so what was a little bit more uh, user cases, uh, if you look at your website, you for sure have references and, and, and customer cases and so forth. What used to be a little bit more um, lyrical, um, meaning that it was described and it had, ni it had nice pictures. Nowadays, customers uh, B2B and B2C would like to see uh, strong fact-based arguments why this value proposition is better than another value proposition. And finally, if you look at the uh, capabilities of the organization, then of course we have lots of data in organizations in ERP systems. We know exactly when the employees come in and out and when they make breaks and how many seconds a telephone call in the call center has taken and, and all of that is, uh, is related, which leads to a situation that uh, IT and data are core capabilities uh, in, in virtually every organization. It doesn't matter in which uh, industry you are working, um, data and IT are core uh, capabilities. You potentially all have heard about the Industry 4.0, or in the US it's mainly referred to Internet of Things, um, which is connected devices in, uh, in production. That is a, a very interesting, very fascinating possibilities arising out of that on the capability side. But I would like to promote an idea, which is customer 4.0. And uh, if you wonder who customer 4.0 is, that is all of us. Regardless of age, you don't need to be young and groovy and digital generation and, and so forth. We all are customer 4.0. And uh, now that it's uh, coming up for Christmas, or recently it was uh, Black Friday, if some of you have maybe bought one of these Bluetooth uh, speakers or you know wireless systems for your home or where, wherever, I, I bet that no one of you turned the box around and checked whether or not this um, uh, product is integrating with the uh, smartphone you have. Because we consumers 4.0 we assume that the world is connected 
we expect companies to not sell anything which only integrates with an iPhone or with a Samsung. It's a, or with a Google um, Android system. So, 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 so we, we, we arrived in markets where consumers, customers, expect the world to be connected. And it's our job in the organizations to solve that by offering value propositions 4.0, meaning regardless what you sell, things will integrate. And I mean, it goes as far as my toothbrush has a Bluetooth connection. I have never switched it on. I don't know why I need that. That's sort of the downside of technology that, that you, you know, over-engineer things. But even that integrates um, with, with all the devices you ever could dream of having an, an integration. And likewise, in, uh, in demonstration, um, consumers, customers expect that things are connected, that in the different channels uh, are the same information so they don't get confused and that there is a correct handover between the channels. So if they went through half of the website um, process, and then need to call that you in the call center can see that they already have filled out certain things and that they were halfway through. So that is the world uh, we, we are living in. And, th and this is one of the analysis um, we, uh, we suggest for companies. One is to understand the business model that is a baseline thing, which most of the companies uh, actually have done. And then a step two is where does data enter our business model and challenges us? Um, because not, not every business model is, is impacted from all the four sides and from all the different uh, versions. So what, what firms need to get a, a picture about is where are we stressed? Where do the changes come? Is it customer-led? Is it proposition-led? Is it uh, the demonstration-led or is it capability-led? And how do we react? What's our plan in order to, to do that? With, with that, I would like to give you three examples how data-driven growth uh, looks like uh, if we take it uh, from, from a Danish uh, perspective. Um, so three Danish examples. Um, here's the first one. Um, yes, don't be shocked. Uh, it is what uh, you potentially thought it was, um, uh, uh, a little animal which uh, lives in the sewer and uh, causing lots of problems. One is disease-wise. That's uh, one of the problems, but the other problem uh, uh, you know, is that they, they have very good dentists and the, their teeth goes through everything. So, so, um, so it's really dangerous and it can uh, cost a lot of money. For example, if uh, that kind of animal uh, takes the main power cable of your production facility, we are looking at something which is uh, four to $6,000 per minute in costs of interrupted production. So, so that animal can be very expensive. And the way we fight that globally, the technology, if at all one can tell it or call it a technology, uh, is like this. So we invite these animals into these boxes and ask them to eat something and from that uh, they get uh, poisoned, which is ridiculous um, to do it. And uh, one company in Denmark thought, this is ridiculous. So I make, that was the aim, they make the world's best Mouse trap, mouse trap uh, but maybe the rat trap uh, is better. And what they came up with is that kind of a system. You may argue it's over-engineered, but at the end of the day, it's actually a fascinating system. So, so it says on the left-hand side, wise trap, and, and that is the thing which goes into the sewer, down where these animals are, and uh, solves the problem there, and you need a little bit of electricity, and it's very difficult to, to change the battery because you need to go down and so forth. So this is why this little box has an antenna, and it is sending data to a dashboard that's called the WISE plan on the right lower right-hand side. Um, so they can follow what's the battery status, and they can only service these, these uh, units which need to be serviced. Um, and while they have, you know, battery, a transmitter and some data and so forth, they thought we, we better send all data, you know, so we know it, that it functions. So what they can report is, um, you know, how many uh, kills they had and, uh, and, and what is the status of the system and, and, and so forth. Um, the, the interesting thing, though, is that it is very effective. It works uh, wonderfully. It's also highly expensive as compared uh, to the uh, uh, poisoning uh, system. But you can document that there has been incidents and you can document that there's no incident so that the problem is solved. 
And when customers, after the problem is solved, call the company and say, oh, by the way, now that the problem is solved and the rats are gone, um, when can you come and pick up your highly expensive equipment? The company says, oh yeah, well, sure, sure, we come and pick it up. But by the way, just one question. Did you cancel your insurance for your house just because it didn't burn down yesterday? And then normally the customer says, that is actually a good point. I want to be sure that this problem never occurs again. So why not we leave the stuff there and you report to me that there has been no incidents. So the issue here is that the market for reporting nothing is larger than actually dealing with the, with the system. So they have growth, which is enabled by data because they can report that there has not been an incident. And also if there's an incident, they know exactly where it was and when it was. So if you are a food manufacturer, that's also very helpful that if by any chance you had a problem, then you know exactly which batch you need to destroy and take out of production. Um, so you minimize your losses as well. So that system creates lots of value uh, in, in places where nobody else can be because poison in food production is forbidden so they have a little monopoly, if you want, uh, in, in situations where, where there's food or pharmaceutical production. This is what I call data-driven growth. You enlarge the market by having data around and about um, that, uh, that system. So if we compare that in the best interest of, uh, we love to talk about disruption, you can see that the incumbents, they have no data, and Wisecon, the company is called, um, is, is data-driven. Um, the effect, uh, is on the one hand side totally uncertain and delayed and non-documented, whereas Wisecon is instant effect and in real time it's documented uh, that it is. It's non-toxic. It can be used for prevention. That's the huge market for for you know reporting that there is no incidents. And of course, there's a different location where they can go to. Two very different value proposition, and the one is data enabled and has lots of growth and um, and interesting perspectives in 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 that one. Two examples more. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, from it basically goes from superficial symptom treatment that's the incumbent uh, to documented prevention, which is data driven in a, in a way. The other example I want to show you is uh, Grundfos, a Danish company which makes uh, money by uh, producing and developing pumps, uh, mainly water pumps of very different uh, versions. But one of the problems why they couldn't solve a pump is that the distribution of water can easily be corrupted. So in areas where water is a very valuable resource, if you pump up water, it becomes the source of corruption. And then a lot of NGOs, if not all, uh, don't really like to install uh, these, these systems. So uh, the Confos engineers, um, they developed uh, what you can see on the picture, which potentially is the world's most important water tap. It is a digitally uh, enabled water tap. So you only get water if you have your card or your smartphone uh, and you can identify yourself. So it's like, it's like a credit card for water which means that it, all corruption is gone because uh, the company or the NGO can upload uh, credits on the card and the individual uh, um, users of the system can only tap the water they are entitled to. And if there is an atypical uh, pattern in the usage, they can immediately in a split second close the account and stop the water. So, so it is a very good system to prevent corruption. And this is where we can say that uh, Confos is uh, going from providing water to documented, fair, and corruption-free water. And the market for corruption-free water is actually quite large. So again, uh, an example how data enables businesses to sell more and have growth. And these are businesses which actually have physical products and look a little bit uh, old-fashioned which are uh, data enabled. And a similar uh, third case, uh, CC Jensen is a company which makes these uh, uh, incre uh, incredibly interesting filters. I mean, is there anything more boring than filters? Uh, if you're an engineer and, and, and in that, that's potentially very exciting, but by and large, you know, it, uh, it, it is a product which has been around for a lot of years, filtering oil. 
What they realized is that while they are filtering the oil, they could as well have sensors around it and scan the quality of the oil. One is to document that they clean it, but the other thing is what they worked out over the years, they know more about the machine than the engineers running the machine because they can see the small particles uh, in the oil and by that they can predict what is the problem with the machine if there is any. So now what you see on the lower um, uh, part of the screen, they have uh, a fully digital uh, monitoring system where they can uh, tell their customers um, how good and what kind of state uh, a certain machine, engine, turbine or whatever um, is. And of course, uh, if you think of uh, wind turbines, uh, offshore wind turbines, it's a very expensive uh, maintenance uh, process. So it's very good to know what the failure is of the machine, when it will occur, how fast do we need to get out because there's weather um, conditions which needs to be uh, honored. And the failure of one turbine is of course also an expensive um, issue for an, an energy producer. So, so what, the, what they have come away from filters, which is a, a product, to the provision of clean oil, which you can say is a, is a service in, in, in some way. And nowadays they are transitioning into the uh, performance insurance that they can predict the state of the machine and help the company to ensure the performance of the equipment um, they have. So again, uh, data runs uh, and increases and improves their, their business in, in that respect. So let's turn to, to a couple of models, how we, how we frame uh, these different parts and, and discuss that um, with companies and, and try to understand how, how they work with, uh, with these kind of, uh, of issues. The one thing is, of course, how do we apply data? And we use an old model from uh, Ansof uh, 57. The logic is the same. Just because we use data these days as a core ingredient of business doesn't mean that we have to throw out all the good uh, theories and models we, we, we had in, in the past. So if we have existing value proposition and existing customers, we can use data to optimize our operations. That's a lot of companies start, that's the initial part of their, uh, op, uh, their travel to data-driven growth, that they use data to become smarter, um, scheduling of production, uh, service uh, schedules, uh, logistics, all of that can be done uh, with data in a, in a much better way. For new customers, it's the optimization of marketing driven in the value demonstration uh, angle. We can, be, we can build better websites, better uh, trade shows, better key account management by understanding the data we have in our systems. And when we talk about new value propositions, that is when we start to upgrade customers and say, listen, do you like to have a new uh, data-driven uh, value proposition? Would you like to have an add-on service where we can give you some reports, some data about the things we, we have? And finally, of course, diversification, which is about uh, new customers and, uh, and new value propositions. Um, in our uh, Wisecon example, these traps also transmit temperature. Um, and uh, they realized that one uh, of the uh, traps reported a very warm temperature. And so they called the distant heat uh, company um, and said, you know, there must be a problem. And eventually there was a problem which they haven't been aware of because the problem was not big enough to be caught by their sensors. So, so we will, uh, in, in two slides from here, call that upcycling, which means your data, which you collect for a totally different purpose, you can upcycle in a new cycle, it makes sense for new customers. So now the company is, is thinking of uh, utility companies in the areas which they cover with their equipment as new customer and a new value proposition to, to help them maintain or repair uh, their system when they can detect um, certain failures in, in, in that. Another uh, thing based on, on Minsberg, a newer model, but still not that new, is of course that we have a strategy formulation at, uh, at some point in time and we make um, an initial, uh, we make a strategy and we have a digitization strategy and this is intended and now the company is, is going. Over time when we implement uh, the, the strategy, there, there's some formational pattern going on that some parts of the best intention we had uh, will not be realized. Some part, of course, will be realized and there will be new issues just coming out of the blue. 
and emerging uh, in, into that. And at some point, we have a new strategy, which is slightly different, but still maintains uh, some, some of the parts. What, what tells us uh, in, in, in that part is that, that it would be very good for data-driven growth if the company has an opinion about it, i.e. has a strategy, has found out why are we doing uh, this kind of, of development of our business model, which is data-driven. It would be very good if there is autonomy in the organization that there is the emerging part coming up because most of these technical solutions which are data driven are not coming from the directors they're coming from the engineers from the sales people from people who work in the field and with uh, the equipment who realize that there's a potential and then try it out uh, often under the radar and the uh, in between between strategy and autonomy which we call business development i.e are we uh, good at bringing together data once we have seen an idea and once we have uh, seen what we could do are we good in developing the business case and bringing it uh, to a decision state where our leaders can then uh, put it into the intended strategy for the next period uh, in in time if we put all our uh, stuff together we find nine capabilities for data-driven growth the data-driven foundation has, of course, to do with data. I mean, you cannot have data-driven business development if you have no data. And that's all about IT infrastructure, sensors, transmission, storage, access, all of that, all data uh, project. Number two, analytics. So we need to have people who then use the data for making reports, for, for, for finding out what do we should focus on. And, uh, and, and these kind of, um, of issues. And the final part of the foundation is permission. Do we have at all the permission to use the data? So we, we wanna understand what exactly is the law about this? Do we have contracts with our channel partners that we may use uh, data or not? And also is society tolerating the way we're gonna do that? Something might be lawful, but still the people uh, will not tolerate it in, in that way. The organization we talked about, we want to see how uh, is the strategic planning, how is business development and how is autonomy uh, in the organization. And based on that, then we have application and we talked about optimization, we talked about cross sales to uh, existing customers and upcycling uh, as a diversification uh, issue. We have measured that with companies and you can see some score low and some score high. Um, so that is uh, exactly how it should be and it all relates nicely to, uh, to success. So these are the nine things we, we can find. I know that this is a difficult chart and not very user friendly. So what about this one? So we have made uh, that, that format uh, to, so that companies can score themselves. And, and discuss within the organization, um, how good are we? What do we need uh, in order to be uh, successful in, um, in the future? I have left uh, the following two slides uh, in, in the set, uh, easy to print out uh, if ever you would like to make a workshop or discuss it in your organizations. The first one you look at now uh, is related to um, what's our business model and how does data enter uh, into the business model? So, so this can be used as a, as a, as a backbone for, for this kind of discussion. And of course, the one we just looked at um, where you can uh, go in and draw and discuss what kind of um, different uh, states of these uh, capabilities do you have in the, in the organization. When you do that, you will realize that not everyone in the firm is of the same opinion. This picture you're looking at is from one company. We made 11 measures, 11 people gave us their opinion about how good or how bad the thing is. And the green line shows the highest score. This is not one person, it's just the highest score in each category. The yellow one is average and the red one is the lowest score because that keeps the uh, anonymity of the uh, respondents uh, correct. And what you can see is that uh, virtually every opinion exists in an organization. So someone thinks we are the best uh, organization ever on that item and somebody thinks we are not really good. One needs to discuss why are people thinking these different terms and, and how can it be and bring the people together to discuss because uh, if, if we are not discussing this in organizations, we cannot run um, the new projects if we have so many different uh, perceptions of, um, of our own situation. The problem we have is 
that the nine capabilities are typically owned by different departments in an organization. And even worse, these different departments not naturally have connecting points that they can work and uh, talk together. So, so we have worked with organizations where these people for the first time ever sit together in one room and having a workshop on data-driven growth, which, which enables a much better communication. And this is one of the difficulties we, we see in, um, in, this, in this world uh, of data-driven growth. I would like to summarize um, by saying, well, uh, most of the service transitions, servitization, if you want, are data-driven because otherwise uh, a manufacturer of equipment, be that construction equipment or copying or office equipment or whatever kind of equipment, cannot make profitable uh, service offerings um, if they don't have any data back to optimize uh, their, um, their, their handling and their operations. So, so, so most of that actually goes hand in hand with servitization and digitization. Most of the disruptions we like to discuss uh, uh, and look at are data-driven. The Ubers, the Airbnbs, uh, the Facebooks, the Googles, uh, the Amazons, and so forth, they are all platform slash data-driven uh, challenges. So, so this is what the competition nowadays looks like, that we have to find ways to compete with our old, tentatively old <laughs> business models um, against these platform uh, business models. Um, one key rule is successful data-driven uh, initiatives. They start with the customer need. We need to have an add-on on value for the customer. If there's no extra value in it, why would the customer ever be interested? And, and how would we recap the investments for our data? That was um, a, a huge problem. And by and large, most, if not all, of the projects we found uh, successfully, they started under the radar as small projects, as trials. You know, before the leaders saw what actually was happening, they already had fear beta versions installed at some client um, operation to, to see how it is. So if you want some uh, guiding questions for your challenge and for, for the issues you're facing, then where and how does data enter the business model? That was the, the, the first part. To which extent are data-driven services part of your strategy? So should you at all go there? Which impact has data for solving these kind of issues? Maybe the issues you face are, are to be solved without data. So just because it's topical to have data discussions doesn't mean that this is what uh, your organization uh, is, is big at. But if needed, what and which level are the nine capabilities uh, at? And if applicable, what uh, would you like to invest in? Which capability uh, needs, needs fixing first? That concludes uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you. And uh, let's discuss. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, this is Doug Olson speaking. Um, just remarkable in terms of the way you presented that. And I, I was really struck by different organizations I've worked with that can often get very enraptured with the technology and overlook the customer need or the ability to um, describe to the customer specifically what problems uh, are being solved by the technology. I think you did a remarkable job with your examples and really driving that home uh, and the analogy of insurance, et cetera. Um, I, I thought something else that I was, I was particularly struck by uh, toward the end was the how many different people really are involved in this at the end of the day, um, whether it's the CIO or sales or legal, et cetera. Um, when you're starting off a project like this, uh, let's suppose that I do get a bit of an idea about how I, I could use some technology or some data that I've got available to me. Um, it might be cumbersome to bring all nine people together, but are there some key people that you'd recommend bringing together initially to flesh out an idea, at least uh, to see whether it's worth uh, moving to the next stage? The, yes, the, um, the, 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 the typical, I mean, you know, every case is unique, <laughs> but, but the, 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 the typical success uh, story is that, um, a customer facing uh, employee, key account manager, call center person, mechanic, repair people, delivery people, who, who you know, customer facing, customer contact people, they, they complain about a certain thing which they find pretty amazingly um, um, 
underutilized at the customer or suboptimal in their operations and so forth. And they share that over a coffee in the canteen. And it, you know, some of the IT people hear that or some of the technicians hear that. And they say, what do you mean by that? And how do we deal it? So, so it's the, the customer side and the, the technology people. And, and, and then there is some sort of enthusiasm. You know, people are different, but some are very enthusiastic about it. So they start doing something. And, 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 and this is where the ideas are. And this is why we have explicitly in our uh, data profit um, uh, model autonomy. Firms need to understand that, that, that they need to give that leeway to, to their employees to trial and error uh, these kind of, of, of ideas. Yeah? So, so this is, but if you then would like to scale that into something which looks like data driven growth then you need the nine people. So, so it's true, um, you know, it's, it's not the first day you bring the nine people uh, all together because they wouldn't know what to talk about. But once you have an idea and once you have maybe had a beta version or some, some more concrete things, I think the lawyers of the organization would appreciate to hear what, what that is to check whether or not they, this is legal and, 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 and how it is legal. Um, and then, of course, the, the sales marketing people would like to know, is that something and we can sell and how do we sell this kind of, of, of services? And, you know, then, then it increases and, and you need to have um, an, an, an overall uh, meeting with these 11 people. And, and this is very stereotypical. I mean, uh, we work with organizations which are much smaller um, than, the, the, than, than sort of the, the, the well-known companies, which are just large. Um, where where maybe some of these roles are are it, it's the one person who 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 has the data and the analytics and and so forth, so so maybe it's only five who who have to meet. I I I'll turn it over to the floor. If there are any other questions out there. Hey Thomas, this is Thomas Hallman here. Hello. Hello. I'm uh, I'm German too, so I really liked all your squares and boxes there. Yes, even even the round thing with the data profit had some edges. So so this is when yeah, a Dane yeah. works with a German. So very 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 uh, very much true. Um, so my question is, when you're looking at implementing this for the firm, that's an opportunity, but you, you got to get to the customer and their value proposition in a way that it makes sense to the customer so that that translating what the customer needs to the data that you have or might get can you talk a little bit about about that essentially turning a product that you have into a solution for the customer from this yeah, I think uh, one one of the key things, uh, and, and this is not um, necessarily only related to data, uh, that is what I what I try to split up in the business model the way I uh, draw it, and I've shown on the earlier slides. Um, that is that the customer need is different from the value proposition. If if organizations, uh, we, they can take that in. Uh, I think we are light years uh, uh, forward to, to really see good innovation. Um, it is still in 2018 that, that firms think in their value proposition as being the customer need. No, no, this is only how you address it. And, and if we split that up, then we can uh, see what the customer actually needs or wants. And, and how we can address that. And, and then there will be pockets of growth, which by and large uh, can be addressed by lots of things uh, amongst which uh, data-driven uh, solutions are, are, are there. And one of the um, examples uh, I, I like to, to use uh, is, is a product launch uh, in, in 2011 of the container shipping company Maersk, which is the largest container shipping uh, company in the world. Um, and, and they launched a, a, a new service uh, where they promised reliable arrival uh, times uh, for, for the containers. And, and, and the critical point is, how did they find out this? Um, they reported that their, their videos on the web and so forth, they, they, they report that they, they met with uh, 60 customers and discussed what, is, what, what do they want and need. And, and you can still see how shocked they are 
uh, in 2011 when they realized that the customers are not interested in ships and containers. They are only interested in that the stuff arrives. And that might be very obvious for all of us outside the industry. But within the industry, they all were so fascinated by their hardware, i.e. these giga large ships, that they invited customers to these ships and they, they, they had big events around the ships and so forth. But they didn't understand that the need is not a ship. The need is transportation of goods. And, and, and this, is a, this is a key point. Um, if, if we want to solve something in a solution business, we need to understand what are we going uh, to solve. And I know it's, it, it is not a new thought. And I think we have written books and papers about this. Or did, you know, we as in the community have, have, have done that. And firms have done a tremendous uh, job in, in arriving there. But there's still um, a challenge to abstract from the value proposition I have in the market towards understanding the, the, the customer need. And the same is with, with data. There are so many uh, offerings, data-driven stuff out there, which never gets used. Most of the apps in the app stores uh, 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 on both ends of the uh, technology, um, most of them are downloaded five times. Um, potentially by the developer and their families. Um, th that's it. So, so it's only a fraction of apps which actually makes it into most uh, mobile phones um, these, these days. And this just shows that, that um, how much stuff is developed which doesn't hit any need in any segment, um, which is just a, a waste of time. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions out there? Okay, well, Thomas, I just want to say thank you so much. I uh, appreciate you so much as a, as a friend and a partner uh, with the Center for Service Leadership um, for your dedication, for taking time out of your schedule today to share this information with us. Um, Thank you. It was it very accessibly presented, um, very coherent, and it really drives home how we can really make a difference in the lives of our customer if we leverage the, the data available to us and present it in a, in a very concrete manner to our customers. So thank you so much. Uh, wish you the very, very best. Uh, Thank you. Day. Thanks for having me. It has been a pleasure. And uh, if there are any questions and so forth, you know where to find me. Thank you. Thank you so.